Hello, this is Nice Wander of the Now Man Show, and I'm here with Mike Garson, who is a keyboardist, pianist, composer, and he is also known as a collaborator and sideman with numerous artists. In this particular episode, we're going to focus on David Bowie. Mike Garson, welcome to the Now Man Show. Nice to be here. When did you first meet David? I met David in um, 1972. I've told the story a few times where I was giving a piano lesson in Brooklyn. My wife was working in the phone rings and it's David Bowie's manager. And he says, can you come down for an audition in Manhattan in 20 minutes at RCA recording studios? Here's the, I have a daughter that's one year old s swinging on a little swing right next to the piano, a piano student there who I just met and I don't know who Bowie is, and they're asking me to do an audition. So it sounded interesting. So I left the piano student to babysit <laughs> my daughter. My <laughs> wife wanted to kill me, and, and she wasn't home. And I went, and Mick Ronson, the lead guitarist, was conducting the audition, and he put the music up of the David Bowie song called Changes, and I played, as I told many times, seven or eight seconds, and. He stopped me and he said, you have the gig? I said, I haven't even begun. He said, I can tell. I play the piano also. So they hired me for eight weeks, and I managed to last there to 2006, on and off. So that you went on tour then with the Spiders from Mars. The first American tour, we opened up in Cleveland. Okay. You want to hear a crazy story? I'm sitting at the piano. Don't forget, I'm playing jazz clubs. Yeah. And I, I'm in a rehearsal. I'm in rehearsal and I look next to me and I see these speakers and they went to the equivalent of this ceiling here. And I said, your PA is facing the wrong direction. And they laughed and they looked at me and they said, that's your monitor system. <laughs> <laughs> so I knew I was in a new arena now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was a whole different world at that point. So um, then, um, is Did you just play piano in the various bands with David? Yeah, I, I played on that first tour some Mellotron, which was an instrument mm -hmm. that sounded like flutes or strings, and it was they used tapes inside. It was fascinating. And then when I was a music director on the Young Americans tour, I played some mini Moog and uh, some organ, but mainly piano. So the, f the, the, the really big album that, that, that happened uh, was the studio album. The first one was Aladdin Sane, right? That was the first one in 1973, and that was pure luck. I get an email every day from someone in the world regarding that album and that total track. Never understood why. I've played on thousands of tracks, hundreds of albums. That's the only one anyone talks about. So it must nothing to do with me, I guess. It was just the moment, the time, the zeitgeist, whatever. So the, the, the story of Aladdin the Sane, how, how did that come together, that song? Well, I was um, in there to do an overdub, and there's a lot of this going on. So Bowie asked for a piano solo, and I played something like this. It stops me, and he said, that's... Typical blues, we don't want that. So he says, try something else, and it goes again. So I start playing things. So playing Latin, these kind of things. And he said, that's interesting. <clears throat> but he said to me, I heard you played on the avant garde scene in, in Manhattan, in New York, in the 60s. Can you do something like that? And my remark, of course, is, you don't want that. That's why I'm not working Saturday night, you know? <laughs> <laughs> he said, don't worry about it. Just do it. And it was one take. And then the band's doing this. <laughs> that kind of a thing. Except they were doing that, so I had both hands to do this. But when you hear it isolated, it doesn't sound so good. He was smart enough to know if you had a solid rhythm section playing a groove, you could play this freeness on top. So that was where his brilliance lied. Because some of that music by itself doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but he framed it in this context with a bass drum and a groove and great guitar playing, and that's how it happened. And it made perfect sense. It was one take, he loved it. 
a few months later, the one of the newspapers in London, I don't know if it was the Guardian or the London Times, right on the top, it's, it was a Bowie quote, quote, and said, Mike Garson is the best rock pianist in the world because he doesn't play rock. <laughs> Typical David Bowie. And uh, I was off and running, you know, in Melody Maker, which is one of their papers over there within a few weeks, like I'm third best pianist in the world, you know, like, where did that come from? Nobody knew me a few weeks early. I was playing in jazz clubs with uh, three people there, making $5 a night. Wow, wow. Could you play the very beginning of time? I've always liked that that introduction you did you know, there. Like I used some a stride piano from the 30s mixed with some avant-garde elements, and I think I played this. <laughs> Time. <laughs> <laughs> That's, That's fantastic. So um, after that, Bowie did a kind of a cover tune album, right, called Pinups. It was all English uh, songs yeah. by English composers, and there was one by Sid Barrett that was called C. Emily Play, yeah. a, a wild piano solo on that I played. Now that I remember. Mm -hmm. And I really liked also the uh, the, the Rolling Stones' uh, "Let's Spend the Night Together" that you did. There. Yeah, he asked for a crazy intro on that, and I did something like this. Something like that. <laughs> See, and that's that's very entertaining as well as actually there's a lot going on there. I think you know it's very easy to, to underestimate what you are creating in that moment. That's right. There's recognition of the melody, there's counterpoint, there's uh, jazz chords, there's virtuosity. But David was very open-minded and he was a great artist, so he heard many things. Mm -hmm. And he knew how to pull that out of me and others. He's like a great producer, which a lot of people don't realize. And that's because he states his overall vibe or vision or concept and then he gets out of the way and lets you do your thing because he knows he's hired you. So everyone he's hired, Carlos, Alomar, Luther, Vandross, Dave Sanborn, Michael Kamen, um, Sterling Campbell, Zach Alford, Gail Ann Dorsey, Earl Slick, Mick Ronson, you know, everyone who's been in his band delivered something that was magical. Producer Ken Scott, Tony Visconti, uh, Niall Rogers on Next Dance. These people, every one of them are brilliant. And he let them do their own thing. And, and he afforded me that same thing. So you continued on uh, working on uh, Diamond Dogs too, right? That was pretty much me and him in the studio a lot because he played all the guitars and all that. And uh, that was a very, very underrated album as far as I was concerned, but it was a great album. And, and my best playing on that, I think, is Sweet Things and The Candidate. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I like that album, and I love the song 1984. I came up with this thing from a, one of those 60s science fiction things, no, yeah. Star Trek or one of those, yeah. and, and then I played harpsichord on it. Oh, great, fantastic. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, that was a phenomenal, phenomenal album. Do you have any uh, stories about Bowie and that, that period of time that stands out, something interesting or unusual that, that would convey something about his personality, what kind of person he was away from the music? He, he, um, he, he was experimenting with cutting up lyrics and this is I think he got something from William Burroughs and I think um, it was fascinating how he was creating his lyrics using this method. So it had an avant-garde touch to it. I was really the perfect piano player for him. In that period from 72 to 74 he fired five bands. I was the only one who remained, more than likely because I could play many styles, because he was always shifting. And the other musicians were great at this field, or this field, or this field. But because I had listened and played so much music, he, he, he was smart enough to take advantage of my gifts. And I was smart enough to keep practicing and want to stay in there and do it, because I loved working with him. He was by far my favorite artist to work with. And also at that time, uh, there was a couple of live albums too, particularly the David Live. And isn't that the tour where were you on that entire tour? And and he transitioned from Diamond Dogs to the Young Americans. Uh, and then it was a very expensive tour, and there was lots of 
stuff on stage was like a Broadway show and we ran out of money. So we went from the East Coast to the West Coast doing the Diamond Dogs tour. When we got to the other side in California, we came back with the Young Americans band very stripped down. And I had a soul band, basically. I was playing with all American musicians that were white and black that understood their music. I was playing gospel things. I wasn't playing avant-garde stuff. On that Young Americans album, it's, got, it's gonna be me. That song didn't get released for 10, 15 years after the album came out. Can you hear me, the Young Americans? These are things that, like, he switched the whole vibe. So that was a, <clears throat> an exceptional tour. The Diamond Dogs tour was phenomenal. It's sad that it was never recorded. He, mm. since then, has pretty much recorded everything we ever did. We missed that, and that was the most expensive, expensive tour. It was just a great experience. And on Young Americans, it's you really, uh, the piano in Young Americans, the title cut, really drove the whole band, yeah, right? Yeah, I set that little pattern up. Something like that. And I used a bit of a Latin, we call it a montuno, and I kind of played something like that. It's not exactly what I played. But um, it gave the whole vibe and the impetus for the rest of the song. I'm sort of good at that as a musical director and as a band leader and as a composer and arranger to find little hooks and then everyone sort of finds their part from there. And it's sort of, it's like igniting the fire and then everyone takes it from there. Did, uh, did you work uh, with uh, when John Lennon was in the studio to do Fame? No, that was in New York City. I was in Philly and Sigma, and there was no piano on Fame. I wished I could have, because I loved John, and I loved that tune. Carlos kind of brainstormed that riff, the, uh, Alomar, the guitarist, and of course, John and Bowie, you know, phenomenal. Yeah, and you and, and uh, producer Tony Visconti and, and Carlos Alomar probably were the three people that played with Bowie more than anybody else, right? Well, or, or worked with Bowie. Tony as a producer, right. mm -hmm. he, he, you know, he knew him from the 60s and he did his last album. So, mm -hmm. uh, but as a player, uh, I've been in the band the longest and then next would have been Carlos. Wow. Mm -hmm. so more than Carlos. And then would be Earl Slick. Wow, that's fantastic. It's hard to believe, but... Because I was only hired for eight weeks, but I must have played 400 concerts with David live. So you got to know him really well. Well, you know, from day one, it was the same as 35, 40 years later, because we, we met on the creative process level. We met, yes. met in the area of love of music and creating something fresh, being ourselves, creating your own voice. And uh, I think that's where we met. So after Young Americans, then there was a period of time where obviously he went to, to Berlin and then you, you came back and when you got the call, I would assume it would be for outside? No, I got the call two albums before that, uh, Black Tie, White Noise, oh, yes, then yes. Booter of Suburbia, yes. which nobody knows, which is a phenomenal album because it was part of a 10 part series in England of a, it was a television series, but he wrote all the music. I did all the piano playing, and he brought the tapes to a studio in Burbank in L.A. I did all the piano playing in three hours. Wow. All full of piano, that album. But, <clears throat> but in that period of time, he said to me, you know, I did a lot of commercial stuff in the 80s, and some of it I felt I compromised my integrity. I would like to put my favorite musicians together. So he picked Brian Eno and myself and Reeves Gabrels and Carlos, and we went to um, Switzerland, and we did the outside album, which was improvised for, I would say, two weeks, three, four hours every day. And then Brian, you know, and David put together the album based on it. But they gave us each one sixth credit for um, co-creating it. What was it like working also with, with Brian Eno on that? Well, I'm playing on a nine foot Steinway gorgeous piano, $100,000 piano. He's right behind me playing a little old synthesizer, <laughs> a DX7. And uh, he's, uh, every day we're going to the music store and buy a little box and attach it to the DX7. And I'd hear like, beep, 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 beep. And I hear these different crazy sounds. I'm playing like this. <laughs> beep, 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 beep. And it, like the two of us, like we covered every aspect of music. Well, he's kind of comes. He comes from it from a minimalist approach, whereas whereas you are all over the place. Right. I mean, I, I know minimalist music, but I, I can't hang there too long, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, he totally is, and he was a philosopher and brilliant. And he also played with Roxy music, and he yes. he loved jazz too. He used to interview me about 
Bill Evans. So he, wow. he, these guys, they're very open, him and David. They want to know. I totally understand how that works. When I met David Bowie, he was talking to me about Stan, Gen Stan Kenton, who had a big band and was a piano player. We're talking about Charlie Mingus, a composer and great bass player. Talking about Monk. You know, he wanted to know all that stuff. And he played baritone sax. That's the big one. You know, and he studied it in England. And uh, very wide palette he had. Yeah. Very, very wide palette. Uh, could you play us uh, one of your Bowie variations, maybe on, uh, on Life on Mars? Well, I can. You know, the interesting thing is I downloaded this <laughs> because I thought it was... I f because I do so many improvisations that have so much um, of my style that sometimes you actually forget what was the original melody. Yeah. And we ended up like, you know, in 2006 doing this in a very much lower key than the original. The original was done by a great pianist, uh, Rick Wakeman. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, uh, from Yes. From, yeah, that's correct. And he, he um, played a perfect piano part. So when I joined the band, I had to find my own voice. So I, I, I handled it more jazzy. So now after all these years, of course, when I was playing it for Bowie, I was not playing the melody. I was accompanying him. So now, since there's no singer here, and he's not around, I'm going to play the melody and the chords and do some variations of it, but kind of play it a little sparser than I, I, I normally am. And I'm going back playing it in this original key, which is uh, <coughs> very different for me. So it's like learning a whole new piece. So I'll play that for you. It, it won't be what I did a few weeks ago on Periscope, because every time I play pieces, I change. That's, that's great. Here's Mike Garson, Life on Mars, Bowie Variation.
that's beautiful. Fantastic. Thank yeah. You. Um, back to black tie, white noise. Mm. Uh, did you work with LL Cool J on that in any capacity? Did Bowie did one song on that album, correct, I believe, right, with LL? Um, I wasn't there for that. Oh, you weren't there for that one. I did a version of Disco King with him that never got released because he changed the version that we did on the reality album, which is the one I, it was just piano and voice. It was the <laughs> but we did many versions. It was w great working with Nile Rogers. He's brilliant and very sweet. <coughs> Lester Bowie <laughs> was a avant-garde trumpet player. Mm -hmm. I think David liked the fact that they had similar names. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And he's playing some wild trumpet playing on it. I'm playing some crazy stuff up here. <laughs> and uh, <coughs> it's an underrated album. Yeah, I think there's a lot of his material from uh, that period that you know, was actually... I'm going to first find out about it yeah. uh, now that he's gone. I think, I think, I personally only probably know one-tenth of his music. Yeah. And God knows how many outtakes there are that I'm on and others that have never been released. So we're going to see a lot of treasures through the years. Well, I have no doubt about it. He's already planned it out from what I understand. So um, now... You also worked on Heathen, and actually, you know, Earthling, forgot about Earthling, that, that was 1997. Actually, uh, at that time, I saw him get his star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. There were only maybe a couple hundred people there. Wow. Then there's Hours, and Reality was the very last album. What I did with him, that has a beautiful song, Loneliest Guy, and Disco King, as I said, and uh, I played on one other very good album. It was a really good album. And then uh, that was sort of my last album with him. And his last two were great albums. And uh, then he did two concerts after the reality tour. They were both with just piano and voice. And I was mm -hmm. privileged to do both of those. And uh, one was at the uh, VH1, was it VH1? Mo uh, Fashion Awards or Fashion something? Fashion Awards, right? Yeah. And then the other was a <coughs> an AIDS benefit. Wow. And that wasn't televised, sadly. So, and that was with Alicia Keys and mm -hmm. David? And they sang Changes, and I played the piano. It was great. And must be a wonderful memory. A great memory. She's a sweetheart, and they blended so well, and she was so nice. She said, you play the piano on this yeah, one, because yeah. it was arranged for her to play it, and I was going to sit out on that. She said, no, I can't do it like you. She said, you play the piano. So it was wonderful. Fantastic memory there. Um, there's a, there's a, before we get to a f some final thoughts here, um, maybe some more music to finish out. I have this quote from your website. It is an incredible compliment, Mike, just to tell you. This is from David himself. It is pointless to talk about his ability as a pianist. He is exceptional. However, there are very, very few musicians, let alone pianists, who naturally understand the movement and free thinking necessary to hurl themselves into experimental or traditional areas of music, something ironically at the same time. Sometimes. Sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes ironically at the same time. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes. Mike does this with such enthusiasm that it takes, makes my heart glad to be in the same room with him. Yeah, I mean, there's been thousands of quotes uh, that I've received over the years since as early as 12 years old. This was the nicest and the best one, and in a way most accurate. But I never would have been able to come up with it. Yeah. You know, I mean, it just shows he's brilliant with prose, and he explained it differently than other people who acknowledge my composing or my piano playing or virtuosity or touch. He hit it, and I mean, it's I'm humbled by it, but it's also spot on. You know, he, he, he got me. That's why we were friends, and I played so much music with him. I'm grateful for that. Do you have a special moment, maybe a, a humorous moment that you share with David that you could share with uh, with his fans? Um, there were a lot of laughs <laughs>, <laughs> on the bus, you know, one, two in the morning when you're in small quarters traveling around the country or other countries. Let me think. Um, he used to get a kick out of my appetite, and they once took a picture where I was eating this gigantic leg of lamb because he you know he was very trim and he, he ate very sparsely to keep his body in such good shape he got a very big kick out of that there's probably hundreds of laughs i could think of right now um that's not coming to mind what's coming to mind is 
and I've told this in a few places, I never was able to tell it while he was alive because it was a private conversation. Now it's somewhat appropriate and connected with, in a lot of ways, his mystique. But he said that um, somewhere in the late 70s, early 80s, he had met a psychic, and the psychic had told him that he was going to die in this period of time when he just passed on. And he said it to me, just the same as you're talking to me, with total certainty, didn't question it, no fear. He just said it to me. And I couldn't go out and tell that to anybody. Yeah. And when the call came in and I heard he had passed, number one, I went into shock, and a second later I remembered that conversation. So he knew this 30 or 40 years ago. In addition, he knew over 18 months he was dying of cancer. So this is not a humorous moment, but it's in a way more important to me because it, 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 he was able to design his life based on that information and the limit time, limited time he knew he had here. So while it's a little personal, I feel okay about talking about it because that's who he is. Yeah. And of course his last album, it's a whole describing everything. When I first heard it when he was alive, I didn't know what he was talking about. It all made sense afterwards. Wow, it certainly did. Um, let's wrap this up. Maybe a, a little excerpt of a Bowie variation and then... No, I would prefer to do a, a, another tribute. This might oh. be my sixth one. Oh, that'd be great. So this will be for David. And uh, we'll see where it goes. Excellent. <clears throat>
Excellent. That was fantastic. Fantastic. So what's coming up next and, and how can people learn more about you and your work? Um, I'm going off to Israel for some concerts, going to England, um, be playing in the States. People could find that on Facebook, my official site. There's a lot there on MikeGarson.com or they could email me at MikeGarson at gmail.com. So I'm available that way. And uh, thank you for, um, you all three of you for listening because the, all the pieces I played were real good today. I don't always play good. <laughs> or I always play good, but they don't always mean a lot to me. But these work, which to me means <clears throat> you guys listen well, understand, and appreciate it because my fingers play notes based on who's around me because I'm not r playing written music. So I'm affected by the environment. So when I'm playing better, it means the quality of the people around me are better. It's fascinating. This has been going on my whole life. That's, that's a great compliment. Thank you. Well, we'll do it again sometime. That sounds fantastic. This is Nice Wonder, and you've been watching The Now Man Show with Mike Garson.